Hello YouTube. One subject that's always really fascinated me is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or uh, SETI for short. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, philosophical problems connected with this field, but oddly there haven't been many philosophers who've uh, worked on it, at least not in the, in the modern era. So in this series I want to introduce uh, the philosophy of SETI. I'll also talk about astrobiology more generally, um, just so you're aware, astrobiology is the study of the origin, evolution and distribution of life uh, throughout the universe, uh, sort of combines astronomy and biology. So in this series we're going to cover some of the philosophical questions associated with extraterrestrial intelligence and extraterrestrial life more generally. Now in this video I wanted to uh, briefly outline uh, some of the history of uh, philosophical speculation about extraterrestrials. I think a lot of people tend to view extraterrestrials as a very modern concern, right? but, but actually uh, scholars have been debating this through all of history uh, and uh, it's interesting to see how their arguments relate to modern ideas. Uh, incidentally, I'll note that historically, the claim that life exists on other worlds was known as pluralism. And so that, I'll adopt that, that term for this, for this video. So when I talk about pluralism, I'm referring to the view that, uh, that there are extraterrestrials out there. Okay, uh, in, the, in the ancient world, there were two main arguments for pluralism, one from Plutarch and the other from Lucretius. Uh, Plutarch focused uh, especially on life on the moon, uh, Lewis White Beck, in his article Extraterrestrial Intelligent Life, summarises Plutarch's argument as follows. Uh, so, first premise, the Earth has no privileged position in the universe, uh, the arrangement of the heavens indicates intelligent design, the moon is sufficiently like the Earth to support life, uh, and if the moon didn't have life, it would exist for no purpose, uh, which would conflict with the evidence for intelligent design. And uh, I see uh, that, that, of course, should be premise four. Uh, sorry about that, it says premise three there. That's obviously uh, the fourth premise. Uh, and and from, this, uh, from these claims, uh, Plutarch concluded that the moon uh, is inhabited. Now, notice that Plutarch uh, was not claiming that all planets must be inhabited. Rather, his point is that an intelligent designer would not create a habitable planet, but then leave it uninhabited because this, this would be wasteful. A habitable environment with nothing inhabiting it would exist without purpose. Uh, now obviously nobody accepts this kind of argument these days, but uh, I suppose it was um, you know, understandable in the context of its time when intelligent design was taken seriously. Uh, and, and after all, you know, I mean, every area of Earth that is habitable is inhabited by something. We find life clinging on even, even in the most extreme of environments. I guess it wasn't an unreasonable assumption that God created environments in order to support living things. Um, so this is sort of one kind of argument that was proposed in, in the ancient world. Um, this teleological uh, kind of argument was endorsed by... Uh, quite a few scholars. A rather more interesting argument, I think, was proposed by um, Lucretius, among others, uh, but uh, Lucretius gave the uh, canonical expression of the argument. Uh, Lucretius was a follower of atomism. Uh, this is a theory that claims that we live in an infinitely large universe consisting just of uh, atoms and the void. Right? They're, 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 there's nothing but tiny indivisible particles flying around in empty space, and all things in the universe are built out of arrangements of these particles. Our world and you know, life itself ultimately arose as a result of chance collisions, chance aggregations between these atoms, building up over uh, millions or billions of years. So the atomists um, rejected the teleological assumptions of Plutarch, right? The, the universe was not designed, our planet was not designed, it does not exist for any purpose, it just, it's just a matter of these uh, chance collisions of atoms building up over time. Now it's fairly straightforward how this kind of view supports pluralism. Lucretius argues that if our world arose through chance collisions of atoms, then given an infinite universe, countless other worlds uh, should have arisen this way also. Um, it's like, you know, if, if you, uh, I don't know, um, take a pack of cards and deal out four aces, well, um, that's unlikely, but you know that if you do it enough, if you, if you 
repeat the uh, the process enough, shuffle the cards, deal out four cards. Eventually, you're going to deal out four aces again, and you know. So it is, you know, for, for I don't know, dealing out uh, twenty cards, or if you had a pack of uh, a billion cards, do it often enough, you're going to deal out the same sequence, given an infinite uh, amount of time. So, so this same kind of argument, right, in an infinite universe our world or a world like it will have arisen again. Lucretia says, and I quote, it is in the highest degree unlikely that this earth and sky is the only one to have been created. This follows from the fact that our world has been made by nature through the spontaneous and causal collision and the multifarious, accidental, random and purposeless congregation and coalescence of atoms, whose suddenly formed combinations could serve on each occasion as the starting point of substantial fabrics, earth and sea and sky and the races of living creatures. So the, you know, any arrangement of atoms will uh, reoccur many, many times. There is nothing special about the earth. Now, of course, um, most atomists still accepted the geocentric theory of the solar system. Uh, they felt you know, that, so the idea that the earth is is fixed and unmoving while the sun moves around it. So in claiming that there are other worlds, they didn't mean there are other planets orbiting stars, rather there are other earths, right? So you know, each earth is fixed in place, perhaps with a sun and planets and stars orbiting it. Uh, these these other uh, cosmoses, cosmos, I, what would be the word there? Cosmi? I, I don't know. Anyway, th th there are other co there are other cosmoses, and uh, but they're entirely speculative and inaccessible to us. But they do exist. Uh, so um, so you know, I mean, that's not uh, a modern view. But nevertheless, I think the basic form of the Lucretian argument is essentially um, still found today. Uh, it, 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 you know, I mean, of course, we no longer think that the universe is infinite, or well, at least we don't think the observable universe is infinite, but it is enormously large. There are trillions of planets in the universe, and the basic building blocks of our planet, you know, the, the rocks and minerals, the water, the gases, these basic building blocks will be found throughout the universe. So if we accept that life is a physical phenomenon, if we accept that life emerged from non-living matter as a result of purely physical processes, well, it's a reasonable assumption that these processes will have occurred elsewhere. Right. I mean, I think this kind of reasoning is is pretty common, uh, and and that's the kind of reasoning people will commonly use to uh, justify a belief in extraterrestrial life, and and that's clearly uh, an ancestor of the Lucretian argument, <clears throat> even though of course we don't accept the precise details of the ancient atomist worldview. So um, those were some arguments uh, for pluralism, but uh, not everybody accepted pluralism, and in fact. During the Middle Ages in particular, um, the, the Aristotelian view dominated, and this view was much more hostile to extraterrestrials. So Aristotle uh, proposed that the cosmos consists of uh, spheres with the Earth fixed at the centre in, um, in, in the terrestrial sphere below the Moon. All things in the terrestrial sphere, so all things below the moon, are composed of different proportions of four basic substances, earth, water, air and fire. <clears throat> the moon, the sun, the planets and stars all inhabit various uh, celestial spheres, and objects in these celestial spheres are composed of a fifth substance uh, that Aristotle called the ether. Now each basic substance has a natural place and correspondingly a natural motion. The natural place of earth and water is at the centre of the cosmos, and so these substances will naturally move towards the centre if no other force acts on them. And that's why many objects, uh, even, when you, you know, even when you throw them up, you impart a force onto a, a stone, say, you throw it up, it eventually falls. That's because uh, its, its natural place is at the centre, it will naturally move towards the centre. On the other hand, the natural place of air and fire is away from the centre, so these will move up if no other force stops, uh, acts, acts so as to stop them. And that's why we see things you know, like sparks of fire rising without being pushed. Um, now, the, uh, the substances organise themselves then into four spheres. There's the, a sphere of earth surrounded by a sphere of water, then a sphere of air, and then a sphere of fire and that's the terrestrial realm. Uh, and then the spheres of the celestial realm are made entirely of ether. 
Uh, also, the terrestrial region is one of change, decay, corruption, uh, whereas the celestial in the celestial re region, uh, things are immutable and perfect, and things move continuously in perfect circles. Um, the, the natural motion of ether is, is circular, but the, the idea is ether is a, is a kind of perfect substance. So that's perfect and unchanging, uh, the celestial realm. <clears throat> now, it's very difficult to see how there could be life on other worlds in this cosmology. Obviously, there is there is no life on uh, the moon or the other uh, planets or, or stars because these are composed of ether, which is immutable and unchanging. Furthermore, there can't be another cosmos. There can't be another Earth, you know, with a terrestrial region surrounded by celestial spheres, because if there were, the basic elements would have more than one natural place. Earth and water would uh, move towards the center of our cosmos and towards the center of the other cosmos, which would obviously be a contradiction. So uh, on the Aristotelian view, there are no extraterrestrials. And this view um, dominated until the Copernican Revolution. Now, <clears throat> so the, the Copernican uh, Revolution uh, it, it, it displaced this um, geocentric theory of the solar system. Uh, and and uh, so this occurred um, sort of f from these kind of 1500s to the 1700s. Uh, and it established that the, the sun is at the center of the solar system and it's a star just like uh, the many other stars that we see in the night sky. And following the Copernican revolution, pluralism became the dominant uh, world view. And there were, there were essentially three motivations for pluralism following the Copernican revolution. So first there was uh, an appeal to I guess general metaphysical principles, the most important of which was uh, what's sometimes called the Copernican principle or the principle of mediocrity. And this claims, to put it very simply, that there is nothing special about the earth. Um, I mean, we already saw a principle of this kind in uh, the arguments of Plutarch and Lucretius. Uh, and in fact, versions of this principle still exist in modern cosmology, uh, in modern astronomy. So uh, it, it seems to be a uh, uh, quite a tenacious idea, uh, but it's basically an assertion of the uniformity of nature, a very important assumption in modern science, because if we, if we, if we assume that, that there is a kind of uniformity of nature, that there is nothing privileged about our position, then of course we can extrapolate um, that the results of experiments performed here will hold across the universe. We can assume that there are uh, general you know, laws of nature and uh, that they are the same everywhere. So I mean this is, so the, the point of the, the, the Copernican principle is um, the laws of nature and the basic building blocks of matter are the same throughout the universe. The stars are other suns, just like our sun. There's a good chance that they will have their own planets, okay, because there's nothing privileged about this this place here. Our sun has a solar system, other stars will have solar systems. Many of these planets will be just like the Earth. Um, you know, it's, it's immediately clear that this kind of principle uh, supports pluralism. Second, there were empirical arguments <coughs> based on the scientific discoveries of the day. We can observe many similarities between the planets. We observe that Jupiter and Saturn, for instance, have moons, just as the Earth has a moon. They have clouds, just like Earth. Mars has polar caps, clouds and dust storms, plus it has uh, dark areas that could be oceans or vegetation. These planets must have atmospheres, air that could be breathed by any inhabitants. Observations revealed uh, mountains on the moon, plus again you, know, you, can, you can see dark areas on the moon that could be oceans, could be vegetation. <clears throat> All of these objects are globes with their own gravity, with day and night, with seasons, just like the Earth. So there are many uh, kind of analogies drawn between the Earth and other places, which supported the idea, well, if life is on the Earth, it's going to be in those places too. Uh, the astronomer William Herschel, who is most famous for his uh, discovery of Uranus, made some interesting observations of the Moon. Uh, in unpublished work, uh, he, he claimed to have observed changes on the Moon's surface 
that suggested growing substances analogous to Earth's forests. Of course, um, t telescopic observation was, you know, it's, it's a difficult craft. Uh, telescopes were often of, of quite, you know, they gave lo fairly low quality images. There could be all sorts of blurring. Um, you know, viewing conditions were not always ideal. So, uh, you know, you don't just get a kind of perfect photograph-like picture when you look through a telescope. It can be very difficult. And so, you know, uh, th this, so you do sometimes seem to observe changes on the faces of, of planets. And Herschel thought he saw changes on the faces of the moon. He didn't. Uh, the, the, the moon uh, is completely barren. But uh, he thought he saw that. He also um, suggested that uh, the craters on the moon were artificial settlements. He says, and I quote, there is a reason to be assigned for circular buildings on the moon, which is that as the atmosphere there is much rarer than ours and of consequence not so capable of refracting and by means of clouds shining therein reflecting the light of the sun, it is natural enough to suppose that a circus will remedy this deficiency. For in that shape, for in that shape of building one half will have the directed light and the other half the reflected light of the sun. I am almost convinced that those numberless small circuses we see on the moon are the works of the Lunarians and may be called their towns. So uh, there were a lot of astronomical observations that seemed to lend support to pluralism. Furthermore, among biologists, belief in spontaneous generation was widespread. This is the view that the origin of life is nothing unusual or miraculous, uh, it's a straightforward mechanical process that occurs on, uh, given the right environmental conditions, and it happens very commonly on Earth. Uh, living organisms are constantly arising out of non-living matter. Uh, for instance, it was held for a very long time that maggots may arise spontaneously uh, from rotting meat. It, it was literally only in the, the, the later 1600s that this was uh, refuted. Um, you know, so... Uh, that was uh, held for a long time. One popular theory of fossils was that uh, not that they are the remains of organisms that once lived, but rather that they are a, I guess you could say, a failed expression of the life generating processes. Um, so, you know, th there are constantly these uh, processes occurring that produce living organisms. And in the case of fossils, you know, this has occurred in rocks. So, which is why you get this uh, sort of living form appear in the rocks. They're not uh, remains of, of once living organisms. They are failed expression of, of, of life generating processes. Uh, then, of course, with the invention of the microscope and the discovery of bacteria, these incredibly simple organisms. I mean, it's, it was understandable why people thought that these might spontaneously emerge uh, from you know, f from non-living matter. Uh, you know, bacteria and, and other microorganisms are incredibly simple. Uh, and, I mean, we could easily, we could reasonably postulate that there are perhaps even smaller, even simpler uh, organisms uh, that, that could emerge that we can't see through microscopes. Um, so, you know, spontaneous generation, very widespread belief. The thought was that abiogenesis and similar processes are constantly occurring everywhere on Earth. So of course we should expect that such processes are occurring on other planets also. Uh, remember, you know, the, the, the idea of the Copernican principle, there's nothing special about the Earth. Laws of nature are the same everywhere. Whatever it is in nature that produces life, uh, it was unknown, but the thought is that should be going on uh, on other planets as well. Finally, there were religious arguments for pluralism. Uh, although by the 17th century, mechanism was widely accepted among scientists, very few scientists were uh, sort of materialists of the uh, Lucretian type. Most believed uh, in the Christian worldview and they held that the world was intelligently designed um, and that we could find evidence of this design in the complexity and sophistication of the natural world. And this led many people to endorse uh, a version of Plutarch's argument. Scientific discoveries have shown that the universe is an unimaginably vast place. Okay? You know, the Copernican revolution, that's, that, that has shown that uh, the stars are other suns. It's, it's, you know, there, there are innumerable other suns uh, in, in the universe. It's very difficult to see. Why would God create all of this just to leave it unpopulated? Um, 
And with the invention of the, of the telescope uh, and the telescopic discoveries, this, this kind of argument became especially powerful because it was clear that the universe contained many objects that could not even be observed by humans, such as Jupiter's moons. These worlds would never have any influence on us, so they couldn't have been created for the benefit of us. Uh, they must have been created for some other purpose. Kepler, for example, um, claims that uh, argues that Jupiter's moons must have been created for the benefit of the inhabitants of Jupiter. I think final, a final point is that it is worth bearing in mind the historical context at this time. Uh, during these centuries, you know, th th these were centuries of discovery, not just of modern science, but they were centuries of exploration. Europeans were actively exploring the world and discovering new lands. Um, you know, the, the, the continent of America had fairly recently been discovered. And all of the places on Earth that people went to were found to contain life. Um, and, and you know, not just life, but civilised life. America, Africa, Asia, all of these continents supported civilizations. So I suppose it was an understandable assumption that, you know, when you look at other planets, just, just as other continents have civilizations, other planets should have civilizations also. Pluralism uh, reached its zenith uh, in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Life was thought to exist almost everywhere. Uh, William Herschel and uh, jo Johannes Bode proposed that life even existed on comets and on the surface of the sun uh, because there was a belief at the time that the sun was solid. So the sun was a solid sphere beneath a, a large bright atmosphere. So the, the light of the sun is produced by its atmosphere above a solid sphere. Um, sunspots were holes in the atmosphere revealing a, the solid surface on which uh, extraterrestrials may dwell. The astronomer Thomas Dick attempted to estimate the population of the solar system by assuming that the population of organisms would be proportional to the planetary radius. Um, uh, in fact, even the rings of Saturn were assumed to be inhabited. Uh, in fact, he, he thought the rings of Saturn would be the most populous area of the solar system. He arrived uh, at um, an enormous figure which I've got written down here and I'm not actually sure how even to say that, but you know, it's uh, it's going to be eight with 12 zeros after it. Uh, and over, overall, he inferred that the solar system contained uh, 21 with uh, 12 zeros after it beings. 21 million million beings, that would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, 21 million million beings he thought were in the solar system. Now, clearly, pluralism was extremely speculative. It was often ad hoc. In particular, I think it's clear that things like the Copernican principle were often applied in fairly ad hoc ways. You know, there's a lot of confirmation bias. After all, science had revealed not just similarities between the planets, it had also revealed many differences. Uh, Newtonian mechanics was used to determine the masses and densities of the planets, and it was known, for example, that Jupiter is over 300 times more massive than Earth and four times less dense. So planets are not all the same. So the Copernican principle has obvious limits. And, and you know, you, I think it's it's a reasonable question, you know, why you would sort of jump to the assumption that uh, planets must all, you know, they must have life on them. Um, but, you know, scholars, the general assumption was is that life probably existed on these worlds. It would just be different, right? And indeed, the differences between the planets supported speculations uh, about the differences between their inhabitants. You, you can predict the characteristics of an organism from the environment in which it lives. So Immanuel Kant, the famous philosopher, he concluded that organisms, and I quote, become more excellent and perfect in proportion uh, to the distance of their habitats from the sun. The Mercurians will be very weak and dull-witted while the Saturnians will be almost angelic. Humans here on Earth occupy the uh, sort of middle rung. Uh, similarly, Christian Wolff reasoned that since Jupiter receives much less light, its inhabitants would require greater pupil di diameter in order to see properly. And the required enlargement uh, of the pupils can be you know, determined from the inverse square, square law of light. And from this, other features of the bodies can be inferred, such as height. He thought that the Jovians must be extremely tall. So, um, yeah, it was... It was extremely speculative, and uh, but it was yeah. This kind of speculation was very popular. 
Uh, it didn't last, of course, uh, and by the mid 1800s or so, uh, pluralism was uh, coming under increasing attack. Uh, John Stuart Mill, for instance, was very critical of the fact that most of the arguments for pluralism were based on these rather strained analogies between Earth and other planets. He pointed out that we actually know very little about other planets. You know that, that they do have some similarities to Earth, but you know, th these are just a few properties, uh, and of course they have differences as well. Um, furthermore, there was increasing evidence of differences. Closer analysis of the moon revealed it to have no atmosphere. So if you observe the moon moving in front of a star, you'll see that the star blinks out immediately. Uh, but if the moon had an atmosphere, the star should fade gradually. Uh, because you know, you'd sort of, the atmosphere would kind of gradually cover the star up as the atmosphere get as the, the as the atmosphere gets sort of thicker and thicker as the moon moves across. The lack of atmosphere also entailed that the moon would have no liquid water because liquid water boils away without air pressure. Furthermore, beyond the solar system, evidence was showing that you know that the universe. You know, it's, it's not just solar systems repeated endlessly. The universe contains many strange objects. There, were, there are double star systems. There are nebulous clouds. There are stars that have significant variations in luminosity over time, so-called variable stars. So our own solar system might, for all we know, be, very, be relatively unusual, right? You can't just sort of... You know, the Copernican principle doesn't allow us to conclude that... Uh, that, that all the other stars are going to be suns with solar systems of their own, potentially capable of supporting life. Indeed, a, a popular theory of the origin of the solar system, um, well, at least it became popular in the late, later 1800s, was the encounter hypothesis. The encounter hypothesis proposed that the solar system was formed when a star came close to the sun, and, and the gravitational interaction between the sun and this other star caused stellar material to be uh, ripped out uh, of these stars, and this stellar material eventually condensed into the planets. Now, if this theory uh, is were correct, solar systems like ours would be very rare, um, and in which case, you know, we would probably not be living in a uh, in a, in a world of um, in a universe populated by life. The religious argument was also being questioned. Uh, William Wewell pointed out. Uh, that ge geologists have shown that the Earth must be at least millions of years old. But if the Earth has existed for many millennia without humans, you know, if, if, if rational beings exist in only a fraction of time, why not only a fraction of space? Uh, we, don't, we don't know uh, God's plan for the universe. So, uh, you know, yes, it's a bit mysterious that he would leave all of this time and all of this space unoccupied, but, you know, that's not, it's not for us to judge. In fact, even worse, um, many people started arguing that Christianity was in tension with, with extraterrestrial life, possibly that uh, Christianity and pluralism were outright incompatible. The basic difficulty is that while the Bible didn't explicitly rule out extraterrestrials, Christianity as a religion seemed to be structured around humanity's unique experience and history, uh, and it, it, it wasn't clear how it could extend to include extraterrestrials. So the point here wasn't just that extraterrestrials you know, might not be Christians. Uh, in fact, I, I would assume that that wouldn't pose any problems at all. After all, um, missionaries at the time were well aware that there were other cultures on our own planet that didn't accept Christianity. Uh, indeed, there were other cultures that had never even conceived of Christianity. Um, so, you know, it, that didn't pose any problems to their belief. So presumably uh, the existence of non-Christian extraterrestrials wouldn't have been a problem either. But the, the point was rather, it's just unclear how the, the Christian theory applies to them. So Thomas Paine asked, you know, were there many creation events, right? Did every world have its own Adam and Eve who then fell into sin or consider the life of Jesus? Should we suppose that Jesus died and was resurrected on an infinite number of planets? Or does Jesus' sacrifice here somehow absolve beings across the universe. So it happened once here. Um, that would, I suppose, put us in a uniquely lucky position. Um, or perhaps uh, extraterrestrials have not fallen into sin and, you know, they, they were in no need of redemption anyway. Maybe the Earth is actually uniquely sinful. 
Now, none of this refutes Christianity, obviously, but it does pose some problems. Um, you know, it's sort of not clear what Christian theory has to say here. You know, there, there, there are, these are difficult questions. Now, of course, as the saying goes, uh, one man's modus ponens is, another man modus, mo, is another's modus tollens. Uh, Thomas Paine himself used extraterrestrials as a stick with which to beat the Christians. Um, he, he concluded, well, since pluralism is true, Christianity is not. Um, but obviously, Christianity was very widely accepted at the time, and so as a result of arguments like these, many people became sceptical of pluralism. By the late 1800s, the universe was seen as a largely barren place. Many people still held out for life on Venus and Mars, um, and particularly this uh, happened with the debate over the canals of Mars in the 1890s, uh, but, but generally pluralism had fallen out of favour uh, by this point. Uh, so, you know, the point of this video is just, you know, there's a there's a quite a rich tradition of theorising about extraterrestrials. It's certainly not just a modern uh, phenomenon. Um, and we'll also see that some of the, the sorts of arguments that were made by people in the past continue to arise in the, in the modern era. As I've, you know, I've already mentioned that the uh, Lucretian argument is quite similar to arguments that people still make today. Uh, so I thought that might just be a bit of interesting background on the uh, philosophy of SETI uh, to, that you can keep in mind as we go through the series. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for watching.